This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, good morning everybody. Welcome to Juma Private Gamers. <laughs> Welcome to the dawn. Hello, my name is Steve. I'm joined by Gert on camera and we're out and about again on live drive and we hope you are as excited as we are. Jump on board to get your coffees and teas and snacks and whatever it else is you need to keep yourself occupied or busy while you watch this morning. And uh, don't forget we are live and interactive. Your questions and comments are valuable to us. Please do send them through using all of the variety of platforms the app the website the youtube chat stream or join the conversation using hashtag wild earth on twitter now Sedis is out and about as well he's heading south and then eric and morgan are out on amakala and they'll be i'm not sure introducing themselves shortly and letting you know their plans now everybody the last couple of days have been oh there goes the lion track the last couple of days don't, it's not the best light to see the tracks, so I'd love to frame it for you, but you're just going to have to believe me. The last couple of days there have been tracks and lions everywhere. Lions, lions, lions. Yesterday morning, two male lions chasing the black dam males, potentially, I don't even know their name anymore. Uh, Kambula male around. Kambula boys came on the property, went off the property. We spent the afternoon with the Kambula male. Um, Unkuhuma Pride came through and off again. Uh, young male Unkuhuma is missing. So, it's tumultuous times in Juma with regards to lions. Andrea, the withdrawals are real. You're excited. Well, let's go see what we can find. There's tracks of a male lion heading down this road he's lying on the junction behind us there and he was moving with quite some speed in this direction we left the kambula male heading west yesterday to catch up with his brothers it was around sandy pats for teller access he was calling i just posted a little story about that now that was him i don't know if he has a name But the buffalo have been in and about and the lions have been in and about. It's been quite an interesting couple of days. But it is cloudy. My jacket is on. Feels a little bit fresh this morning, but let's go see what the weatherman has to say. Good morning, good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. You are here with us live at Amakala Private Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape with myself, Eric, and Morgan behind the camera. And this morning, we're going to be your eyes and ears on a very, very beautiful, beautiful morning. As you can see, the sun is about to come up. Have a look at that. That is too cool. There's still one star that is present. And it would be the evening star and the morning star. The traditional Bushman folklore, the star is the travel star. So it's the first star that they see in the evening. That's a cue to stop traveling for the day and find a camp. And in the morning, when that is the last star to disappear, that is the cue to pack up camp and to continue moving on your travels. Very, very excited to be on Amakala this morning to see what we can come across. 
You know, just like Steve has said, he's had lots of tracks of lions and buffalo up in Juma. Well, we've also had one buffalo encounter already, very, very dark encounter, um, that he wasn't interested in sticking around. Puma, thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to be back. It's good to be back and out and about. Yeah, lots of lots of noises, familiar noises. We've got the obviously the southern Bobo. He's making a lot of noise down there, announcing his presence. Some somber green bulls. I thought I heard a, a, a green wood hoopoo earlier. I may, I may have been mistaken, but uh, well, we do get a lot of them in this area as well. I think what we're going to experience this morning is a very, very nice sunset. Look at the color of those clouds over there. That perfect pink candy floss. Now, for those who don't know, Amakala has received a decent amount of rain. So when the light does come to us, we will see lots of green. Golden eyes, wow, indeed. It really is. I mean, this is, I think, definitely the, one of the best sunsets to start, sorry, sunrises to start with. Yeah, I haven't had one like this in, in a while. I know we had one towards the end of our last shift. That was pretty cool. But uh, we haven't had anything like this. A fair amount of clouds on the horizon but not too threatening in any way very very light clouds just giving a little bit of color to the sky as the sun well attempts to try and poke its head out for the first time this morning but uh, now obviously with the rain that uh, we've received going to be a lot of happy animals in Amakala this morning, I'm sure. It's going to be a lot of happy mothers, especially those of antelope that have to produce milk for their young. With all this lovely green grass, they'll be able to produce more than enough healthy milk for their calves and their foals in order to make them strong. Especially now that it's a bit chillier in the mornings. Obviously starting to head into winter. Because I have a good feeling about the sunrise safari as well. I think it's going to be a special one indeed. And I think that we may get lucky today as well. It's, you never know in the bush, you never know, you come around the corner, you see something new. It's all very unpredictable, especially in the early mornings like this, where you don't quite know where animals have moved to and from. Know that the the pride of lions was not too far away from this area, but not in the area. Oh, Ralph, absolutely. This is amazing weather to be in. Can't wait till the sun comes up, starts warming up. It's going to be a warm, warm day on the Macaulay. Not too warm, but warm enough. And... Uh, no, I think it's going to be an amazing day today. I haven't heard any calls of the lions, uh, any alarm calls of any sort. So I do wonder, I do wonder where 
our pride of lions have. Have they headed further east? Did they come further south or west? And did they go further north? It is a mystery. I'll never know. A lot of, um, an awful lot of pied crows moving around at this time. You know, obviously coming from their roosting spots at night and you'll find um, that they'll congregate on, a, on electric lines and trees and all sorts. KM, I've missed being out here as well, I'm, I must say. I must say, it's been, it, uh, oh, the last two weeks have been great, but uh, without that animal effect, it has been a little bit different. So yeah, I'm very, very happy to be back. But you know, you'll normally find a murder of crows uh, at nighttime congregating together, and then in the morning they almost go in their separate ways. And uh, here at Amakala, we have like, it's not a specific, sp a specific place where they hang out. It's, uh, no, it's a specific kind of uh, length of uh, electricity line or telephone uh, uh, line, telegraph line. And uh, then there's also a dead tree, a pretty biggish dead tree that uh, you'll find a lot of crows uh, sitting on towards the end of the day. And then in the morning when you come past, they all fly away. Well, not fly away. Most of them have left already to start their foraging for the morning. So we're watching the color of these clouds here. And they're slowly going from a very, very dark orange to now a fairly lightish pink, which means the sun's getting closer to the horizon. And uh, I suspect within the next 20 minutes, we should start seeing a little bit of light. And we're going to go straight into that golden hour. There's no clouds on the horizon that are going to prevent us from experience, experiencing such. And that's amazing. I cannot wait. Now, this is uh, day two of no rain. So I imagine the excitement should still be the same. Those clouds are unbelievable. Oh, thank you so much, Eric, and it's so nice uh, being out here this morning, and uh, yes, it's so nice being alive with everybody, and I can, cannot wait to interact with all the viewers out there, and uh, well, I'm at the Twin Dams at the moment, just overlooking this area just to see if we can get any luck with some uh, whiskers around here, but so far, uh, nothing, but yeah. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cedric, and behind the camera with me on Rusty, we've got a BK. So, yeah, I cannot wait for this morning's drive. Uh, so much has been happening over the last two days. I think uh, Steve has been talking about uh, lion tracks all over the show. And wow, yesterday afternoon uh, we went out, and uh, there's so much lion, male lion activity. So, we actually tracked down two big male lions that chased the uh, black dam males into. Uh, Juma yesterday morning uh, they're on the eastern boundary of uh, Juma 
coming in from Torchwood and then we're going to do a little bit of tracking and oh, we found uh, two Machle Machle males. It's the first time I've seen them. Uh, big boys, one with a very, very black mane, and the other one's got a big golden mane and uh, very like kind of droopy eyes. But uh, wow, they are quite impressive. So I'm hoping that we are going to head back into the eastern area again and we're just going to go and see if uh, anything has changed there. Kelly, yes, uh, always nice, and uh, you know it's been very interesting because uh, the dynamics at the moment, as all well, for the dynamics over the last year or so, it's been quite uh, quite hectic with the lion activity this side. So, but uh, it'll be nice to see if we can find the black tail males. So, the black tail males is the two male lions that's uh, the territorial bo uh, boys of the northern Saudi sands, uh, but they've been pushed. Uh, we, yeah, they've been pushed by other males. So, uh, I think there's a lot of pressure in this area. I'm just hoping that they try and, you know, put a firm uh, a paw down on this area and uh, try and keep the other boys out here. Especially that there is one female known as Chilla, um, that she had cubs in this area. But we haven't we've seen tracks of her now and again, but, you know, real confirmation that uh, her cubs are still around because there's been so much lion activity, so much buffalo activity. But yes, I'm just uh, happy just to be out here on a beautiful wild whisker Wednesday, indeed. And then I think, as I said, I am going to go to the eastern boundary. But I'm just going to keep my ears open a little bit here. Like alarm calls of uh, Franklins that's happening in the bushes just behind us. So I want to see maybe something pops out. Oh, giraffe girl, yes, I can imagine. It's nice just to get back live again and uh, we'll just interact with everybody, you know. We'll, as you know, this is like the large, uh, largest uh, live safari vehicle in the world. And it's nice just to have everybody on board with us again. And, uh, you yeah, we can just see what we can find. I also saw Langa uh, Monday morning, Monday morning, yeah, close to Twin Dams. As a Langa is a leopardess. And she was actually moving this way, but I think with all this line activity, hmm, I think the leopards are lying a little bit low. I know Steve said he's got uh, tracks for a female uh, leopard on the western side of Juma. So, crossing fingers that he comes right there. But it's nice just to listen to the bird choruses for the morning. All right, well, we are going to start moving slowly to the eastern boundary to see if we can pick up on any of uh, like fresh tracks of those lions. Uh, I think let's head over to Steve as he is busy following up on a female leopard. Thanks, Setters. Well, our lion track disappeared into the block, but we found fresh female leopard tracks that we were following. I can only assume they belong to Shadulu. But then she hits a, a wall of buffalo activity and she's vanished into the block over there. So I'm just checking this road a little bit more south. And then I'm going to go around and check that road up there. I mean, if it is Shadulu, that is kind of, this is the road she likes. And then moving onto that side, she likes it quite a lot. Could be anybody, really. Nope. Female leopard is what I can tell you. Female leopard tracks. So yes, the leopards have been pretty quiet the last few days. The lions have just been everywhere. Tracks everywhere. I don't really know what's going on with the line dynamics. It's a very busy time. Mm -hmm. 
So 50, it is really summing all the comings and goings, but it'd be nice if the Kambulas, the four of them, decide to establish because we just need some solidity. Um, had a video sent to me yesterday from Torchwood of uh, two black, very dark maned lions chasing the black damn males and the black damn males didn't look like they were really up for the, the battle or the confrontation. Who are these other two? I think Cedric remembers their Matla Matla or something like that. Um, but who are they? I don't know who they are. But we need some solidity. We need a coalition of four males to just say, this is my patch and let's be done with it. Moving in, moving in, moving in, moving in, moving in. No one really is establishing. Although the Kambula male we were with last night, he was sent marking. He was being quite vigorous about claiming territory. But he wouldn't want to be caught on his own. Wouldn't want to be caught on his own. Oh, on Monday morning, we found a female giraffe with a little baby. A little, wee little baby. It was probably born on Sunday, maybe on Saturday, but brand spanking new little giraffe. I'm gonna head back over towards the western side. In general, see if we can kind of see if we can find her again. I found her and Bika was like, oh, she's been hanging around here the last few days. I was like, okay. And then you just saw the baby moving. Yo, and then the baby got a bit frightened and it ran. And then mum runs after it with her ears forward. Because obviously the adult knows that running away from her is potentially dangerous and running away from us because, well, it's never seen a vehicle before. Probably like, what is that thing? But she knows the potential dangers of the baby just running off on its own. She galloped after it a few times. And with the amount of lions we have on the property at the moment, a very dangerous affair, leaving mum's side like that. Even having mum next to you can still be quite dangerous for a young giraffe. Sorry, Jordan, I only got the end of that. Did you ask a question? Very sweet Laura Cam, still had the umbilical cord attached. The ossicones are still sort of a little bit messy and to the side. Very, very new little youngster. Couple of days. Amazing how they can move though, after a couple of days. We have come further down from our little sunrise perch spot. We are now sitting almost in the middle of the dune forest. Found our way to a path where there is two game trails coming and going across the road. So I'm just having a quick scan at the path and seeing what came past this morning in the course of last night. At the moment, nothing really too interesting. Well, everything is interesting, but uh, we've had some bushbuck, we have some kudus, warthogs, and jackals. That's been what's been traveling along these paths for now, but we're gonna obviously keep going on and see if there's anything else that we can find maybe along these paths that might lead us to something special. No, this is obviously a very nice place for the birds. And they've made that very, very clear. Upon coming in here, they've become very, very vocal and are sharing their news with us. Charlotte Jackson, I also can't wait at all for what 
we are going to see. And the light is now starting to really, really come out. And the excitement is looming. And the sightings are pending. But so far, it's been quite nice. Enjoyable. And it is also starting to warm up, which is also quite nice as well, because it was uh, very, very chilly this morning. Yeah. Lots of sombre green bulls in this area, and the southern bobos. That does seem to be it. There's no book Makiris. Where are the book Makiris? I'm sure we will have a, a book of Kiri Pe calling in duet in no time. I think they haven't quite woken up yet. I think they're sleeping in a little bit. No problem with that. And I will definitely hear them today. But uh, in the meantime, like I said, lots of somber green bulls and uh, southern bobo, which has a large variation of calls. So you may think that it's two or three different birds that are calling in the same tree, but it's actually one. And um, when we were studying to become field guides, I must say the southern bobo, the double collared sunbird, and the was it the fiscal flycatcher or the comp? Both. I think it was fiscal flycatcher and common fiscal that made it very, very hard. Because the sunbird and the fiscal flycatcher have very, very similar pitches in their calls. The southern bobo just has far too many calls. And now that we know what the Southern Bobo's calls are, it does make it a little bit easier. There we go, there's one of the calls. The whoop, whoop. Very nice call. I say learning Bird calls is a bit difficult, but once you hear him, once you know him, then it does get better. Can I go? Indeed, it's lovely to be back. Lovely to be back, indeed. Sharing all that I know with the world. I'm enjoying it so far. And uh, well, like I said, I hope this morning we can show you something incredibly special for our return to Amakala. Not too long now before the sun is going to share its golden light with us. I know I said about 20 minutes and that was about 15 minutes ago. I changed my answer to maybe 25 minutes. I mean, it's close to the horizon, but it doesn't seem to be too, too close to the horizon. We're not yet starting to see that orange bulge, that yellow bulge on the horizon yet. Jake, um, it can, it can help. Yes, of course. You know, knowing which trees birds like to feed on, and knowing which trees you find most birds around, it does help. <clears throat> Excuse me. Say, for example, we're looking for a pale chanting goshawk, or we're looking for a comet buzzard. The first place you want to start looking at is, um, I've found in Amakala, a lot of them tend to perch on top of sweet thorns, 
dead sweet thorns, still alive sweet thorns. Um, and what else? What else? Most of the time, <clears throat> most of the time, we have seen them only on the sweet thorns. So there's specific areas where we know we can find those birds. We will look at those specific trees in order to find them. But um, yeah, it can it can definitely help knowing which trees birds like to be in and around. Like for example, a southern bobo and a sombre green bull, they like a thick bush. Not necessarily, it doesn't have to be the biggest bush, a thick bush just to be able to conceal them. They'll come out of the bush, make a few calls, and then they'll dash back into the bush to hide again. Now, I've said it before that uh, the sombre green bull is probably, it's not the hardest bird to find, but when you can hear the call nonstop, it does become a little bit difficult to find them. They're very skittish, don't like to come out in the open. Very pretty, olivey, sort of green, olivey color bird, medium sized. And there's a lot of them that we can hear at the moment. Sounds a little bit like an argument between the two different ones because we hear one going off and then you hear the other one reply and then the other one goes off and then the other one replies. Back and forth, back and forth. Oh. I hear a brown hooded kingfisher. I think brown hooded kingfishers are cool birds. Oh, Linda, it is our pleasure. Sight and sound is, I think, one of the most important aspects of a safari. You need to be able to hear the sounds of the bush. Because when other animals are not making noises, these are the noises that fill the gaps, that fill up the atmosphere. These are all day, everyday noises. You'll have to excuse my stomach. It is growling like a male lion, very upset. Very quiet on the four-legged creature side. Haven't heard any commotions, not even a call. But on our feathered friend side, we are winning. Lots of lovely calls. I think what we will do is we will continue going down this path and see what we can find. In the meantime, we're going to send you up to Cedric. Thank you, Eric, and uh, yeah, I think uh, you need to put some uh, breakfast in that uh, tummy of yours and uh, stop it from uh, growling like that. Maybe a rusk or two, maybe a biscuit, maybe a apple. What do you suggest, BK? Uh, rusks. rusks, huh? Yeah, so BK, he suggests rusks. Yes, I think that's a good idea. I'm the same, Eric, don't worry. My stomach always halfway through the drive, all of a sudden I get funny noises coming on my tummy, so that's usually the, the case. But uh, I spoke to one of the guides. So in the west on Simambili, because the Kambula males and the, and the sister went all into Simambili yesterday or last night, although three of them were already that side and the one was still on Juma and then that individual also went into Simambili. 
and to kind of uh, link up with his other three brothers and his sister. And uh, they ended up there on a buffalo kill with uh, the Nkuma pride. I'm not too sure how many members of the Nkumas. So, interesting. So the Kambula males and the Nkumas are together at one at one sighting on a buffalo carcass. That's how it Simambili. So Simambili is just to the west of Juma. Hopefully, maybe if they finish well, all, all those lions, those big uh, tummies, talk about tummies, <laughs> but their tummies, um, I think they will finish that uh, carcass off it very quickly. Anna Marie, the, the lion dynamics have been absolutely quite fascinating. I think so many males around, and. Uh, the two boys that we really think that should be seen more here and be more vocal and all that is not that vocal and that's the black tail males so and the, but uh, we had their tracks yesterday afternoon pretty much running straight south into into uh chetwa and little gauri area so i was actually hoping that they might have come back north during the night time, but uh, I don't think so. I think they're a little bit uh, scared. Those muckly muckly males, those two big boys. Wow, wow, wow. I haven't, I haven't seen males like that for for a long time. I don't know when last. I think the last time I seen big main lions like that was Matimbas, was Hairy Belly and, uh, and Ginger. Those two male lions, that reminds me of them. But uh, yeah, mm. big boys. Big boys. And you can see typical Kruger lions because when I walked into them, when I was on foot tracking them, and I walked into them yesterday morning, uh, um, they were pretty much uh, just, they, yeah, they didn't even growl at me, nothing. They just like kind of, I was beaker, they just like kind of bolted. They just, yeah, they just ran um, away from us. And so, yeah, clearly they're not too used to people on foot. And then eventually we got a nice view of them for a few minutes, like for like two minutes, yeah, about two minutes. And then they disappeared east. Alright, so plan of action now. Um, I am going to go towards uh, Biffelzook Dam. That's a dam that's on the northeastern corner of uh, Juma. What's well, also happened there two days ago, we picked up on a, a young a water, uh, water, a water buck, a young water buck. What, uh, that was pretty much taken into the water by the crocodile. Uh, we didn't see it happening, but uh, of course that must have been the case. And uh, yesterday afternoon again went past there and it was just the head and the neck and pretty much just maybe the front quarters of the water, uh, water buck that was still floating around there. So I think that's why I want to go there this morning just to go and follow up on that quickly and just see if we can uh, maybe see the crocodile busy feeding. A bit cool, but you, know, you never know. Never know. Might get lucky there. Well, I haven't seen Tlalamba tracks. Tlalamba's tracks went north into Biffelzook, not yesterday, the day before, on Monday. And Lepidus went straight up that side. Charlotte Jackson, yes, uh, it was very nice creating new content. Uh, very, it was very interesting, you know. Like, uh, you know, I'm coming to the end of my six weeks now. It's my last uh, last day today uh, before I go and leave tomorrow. So for six weeks, you can imagine every single day I've had the directors in my ear. Uh, plus, I've had all you viewers sending in questions and comments and all that. And then all of a sudden, it was quite a change, you know, for me as well and for all of us. Uh, we I didn't have any directors in my ear, and we were just going out to. Look for content and look for stuff to pretty much um, you know film and all that. So it was nice. It was it was a, it was a it was a nice little change and all that. But of course I missed everybody. I missed all the all the viewers and uh, you know sometimes it's just this, this interaction is always uh, fantastic. I love it and it feels like I'm I'm talking to people all the time. You know and that's uh, that's uh, so important. So yes. But anyway, let's head over to Bufflesock Dam. Going up New Island North, uh, Jordan, I don't know, just let's see how the signal goes up this side. Alright, let's, uh, while I try and get through this dodgy signal area, then let's head over to Steve and to see if he's, uh, or how far he's tracking has got to with that female leopard. Well, welcome back. Welcome back. Oh, we got the update as well about the, uh, 
the Kambulas and the Unkuhuma Pride, having killed the buffalo on uh, Simumbili Driveway. Lucky for them over that side. And uh, tracks of the female leopard, we found them on uh, Mendoza slash Monkey Orange Road, heading south. And uh, they crossed Triple M and Shadulu, and then they have been found on Arethusa Safari. So, yeah, we're gonna we've come back onto Juma. Now we know that th that avenue is closed. We'll continue checking other avenues. We've seen a couple of hyenas around. There's tracks everywhere. We came out of camp this morning and I saw what looked like a small hyena, just the shape. It was quite far off. It was in the road. It had the whole shape and body posture of a hyena. And then I, we went towards it and it ran away. We never saw it again. So I don't even know. I mean, it was the size of a wildcat, but had the posture of a hyena. What else could it have been? I don't know. A little hyena of that size on its own close to our camp. I have absolutely no idea. Maybe there's a new den in that area. We were circling the block looking for cat tracks and uh, maybe we'll have another look later. But it's quite close to camp. No real den site that I know of over there, but it'd be worth investigating. We'll be heading through. We'll be heading through Juma shortly from Trias Dam back towards the north, and then just scratch around that area and see if maybe there isn't a small little hyena den that's been established there close to camp. Lovely weather we're having, everyone. Nice and overcast. Doesn't make tracking very easy when the light is like this. You're not really getting that contrasting angle. It's okay. We've had a few tracks we followed and they've exited, so that is also successful tracking when you. Oh, you see it lying there in the grass. Got it. Am I good? Sometimes all you see is just the slightest movement or shape and you wonder what it is. And uh, even though Ghat saw it before, he's, he can't see it now. Maybe I need to go back half a meter. It should be in the middle of the screen. Okay, let me move back a couple of inches. I wonder if anybody else has any idea what it is we're trying to show you. Maybe it ran off. It's, it's laying down there. <laughs> it's laying down. We can't see it anymore. Hello. Hello, good morning. I didn't see it run. So I think it just tucks itself up behind the bush and is hidden from view. And you might be wondering, what on earth are you looking at? And well, we're not looking at anything right now, but it was the head of a male steenbok. It was a head of a male steenbok there. Elka guessed it correctly. Well done, Elka. Can anybody see it? I can't see it anymore. And that is exactly the point, everybody.
This is really cool. The roads are teeming, teeming with tracks, um, especially the further east that we come. We've had jackals, I've seen porcupine tracks, I've seen something that looked like it was possibly a snake or a smallish animal may have been rolling along the road. Um, it looked a little bit like a slither. Then we've got deep kudu tracks, so kudu ran across the road here. Obviously the vehicle tracks, but um, we've also come, th come through a couple of puddles. And in those puddles have been marsh terrapins. Now this is something that happens fairly often after it rains a lot and you get these rather large puddles. You'll find marsh terrapins living inside of them because it's enough to make a home out of. Um, and uh, we've got to be really, really careful when we drive through puddles. You've almost got to kind of stop or before you get to this puddle, look into the puddle and assess just to make sure that there aren't any little heads sticking out. I mean, you'll know instantly, you'll know immediately as soon as the front part of the wheel or the first part of your car touches the, the puddle, you will start to see movement, them starting to move around because they know that the cars are going to come through. Alright, we're going to continue, but we're going to send you up to Cedric who has something interesting for you. Look at everybody, we've got this crocodile that's busy eating the water buck. Oh my word. He's trying to rip some of the meat off the water buck now. So you can see it does like that quick. That's a big croc, eh? This is exactly what I wanted to see uh, at uh, Biffleswick Dam. What I told you a little bit earlier. It'll be nice to see if this crocodile is going to be eating this water buck. So it made this kill about two days ago. I think about Monday morning. So you'll see when it comes and bites onto the water buck. I think it's just waiting for it to the meat to just to soften. And now what it's doing when it grabs it, it pulls and sometimes it does a little bit of a roll just to see if it can strip some of the meat off. So it's just the head and then like the neck. It's floating around there now. We're going to just keep quiet. I don't want to spook it. The Darcy Millie, yes, this is amazing. It's nice just to see a crocodile busy feeding. You don't get to see that too often. And never here at Bifflethook Dam. I don't think uh, I've ever heard of a crocodile busy feeding on a... A water buck here, watch, he's going to go to it again, he's going to try and grab it and he's going to try and see if it can rip some meat off again, watch. and he's going to try and do a quick movement now to try and rip it off. I'll rip the meat off there. And I'm just trying to remain a little bit silent. I don't want to go and spook it. We were actually talking about it uh, a few days ago when we were sitting here and watching this crocodile. And we thought it was about two and a half, but then we actually realized it's much bigger than two and a half because it came close to the surface yet or close to the side. And we realized that this crocodile is at least about three and a half meters uh, long. It's a, it's a big crocodile. It's a big crocodile. You do not want to be swimming in this dam. Is 
These are sharp teeth. Look, big teeth. Evan, yes, it does, a death robot. I think he's going to try and pull it again to try and rip off that. Because it's not like a lion and leopard where they've got conacea shears where they can cut. Crocodile's more for gripping with those big teeth, grip, and then pull and like twist to try and tear the meat off uh, the body. So he's like trying to hold on to it now, and you're going to see he might do it with a quick motion. Try and get some more meat off from the neck area. Because this carcass has been floating around you for two days, you can imagine, almost three days now, you can imagine it must be almost very, very soft meat now. I think it's just uh, got to that point where it almost uh, the meat falls off the bone and uh, that makes it a little bit easier for the crocodile to kind of pull, pull pieces off. Sorry, Jordan, go with Anna Marie's uh, question again. So it reminds uh, you of being in the Mara you know, during the Great Migration. Oh yes, I can imagine. I can imagine. Oh, that is one of the things. That my, my folks are very lucky to go and watch the Great Migration and watching them going across those rivers. But uh, uh, it's on my bucket list. One day I'll be able to go there for a few days, and I'd love to and, and take a look at that. Look at those crocodiles. big meal like this for this crocodile is going to be perfect. It can last them for months without actually even thinking of getting another meal. They can really just slow their metabolism down completely. You'll find even their heart rate is like one beat per every two minutes. So they don't use that much energy. They don't burn that energy off. Good meal like this, perfect for this crocodile for a few months. Only yet, poor, poor water. Okay, it's going to try and twist it again. See if it's going to try and pull some more off. for the noise I think BK is uh, suffering once again a little bit of the hay fever I can imagine with all this dry grass around now coming through oh, it's a crack coming up there now I might try and push it to the side again or I might just leave it let's see
And we've been very fortunate here at uh, Biffelzook Dam having this crocodile here for a couple of weeks now, which is fantastic. And just brings up a whole new kind of dynamic, a new sighting for us around this dam. piece here at the end. So what it does, it pushes it to the, almost like to the, to the bank, see? So it's got a little bit of leverage. Stuck in bed, yeah, this is very cool. We don't get to see this often. This is something that, you know, we know it happens, but we don't get to see it. It's always nice to watch, like a crocodile, for instance, uh, the feeding behavior. Welcome back. We've found the group of Nyalas here in the open area, foraging for all the herbs. Nice to see a group of male Nyala together. While I was on leave, I think the male Nyala that hangs around our camp got uh, devoured by... No, it wasn't him. Wasn't him. Wasn't Moses. No. Thank goodness. I haven't seen him in camp since I've been back, so I was worried. But uh, we're slowly heading back towards the area where I saw that small little animal. How long ago was that now? An hour ago. Just, you know, thinking maybe it is a hyena. And there is a den, and, and it wouldn't have gone far from the den. But it's not an area I'm familiar with there being any den at. But that would be quite an interesting development. So let's not build it up too much, everybody. Let's just say I'm going to go investigate an area we saw a strange little animal an hour ago. And take it from there. Clearly no Nyala females in sight. These boys are playing nicely together. No posturing, no body language shifts. Just feeding out here in the open. Oh, Lauren, well, they are a gorgeous animal, aren't they? They are one of the prettiest animals, one of the prettiest antelope. Very impressive looking horns. And they're a lot heavier than you think. They weigh over 100 kilograms, 110 kilograms. I remember finding a dead one up in Pufuri, about 70 meters from the river, crocodile infested river. So I thought, well, I'll just move it to the river there and help the crocodiles out. It was, I couldn't move it. It was just too big. 110 kilograms dead weight. Oh, a little bit of animosity between them that was my flower oh you don't often see Nyala fight everybody I've only ever seen it maybe three times they will obviously postulate or show themselves how big they are avoid confrontation and only when they feel like they're evenly matched or they're able to transcend to the next step will they move into physical confrontation 
were probably one of the most dramatic, although slow, encounters before a fight is the famous Nyala dance. And if you've never seen that before, these males will pile erect their fur, so all of their fur will stand on end. They'll lower their head and they'll dance like a very slow moving ballet around in a circle as they watch each other. And only if they deem themselves to be of equal stature will they physically compete. Anna Marie, the dance is quite magical, isn't it? It's been a while since I've seen one, but a couple of days ago we were here pretty much in the same area, probably with one of these boys, and a big kuru bull was walking up the hill, and the Nyala started to pile erect. Um, I don't think he managed to get bigger than the kuru, but the kuru just glared at him and carried on walking, and I think the Nyala breathed a sigh of relief that the kuru didn't pile erect and start dancing with him, because he most certainly would have lost that battle. Well, I was talking about Nyalas and crocodiles earlier. I didn't manage to get that Nyala to the river, but Cedric's with the remains of a water buck and a crocodile feeding. Thank you, Steve. And uh, yo, we are still here at uh, the dam with uh, the crocodile that's busy feeding on its prize, a young water buck. And just doing it on its own time, not really rushing anything. And again, pushing it, looks like just pushing it out a little bit now, out from the edge of the water, yeah, a little bit deeper. But it's really eaten, well, it's already eaten quite a bit. I think it's about maybe three quarters it's gone. As I say, it's just the head and the neck. It's uh, remaining on this carcass. Very interesting. But that was so nice to just get to see uh, this crocodile busy feeding on it and then ripping the meat off. Oh, brilliant. Mm. Almost like nudging it, nudging it around. Uh, Annabelle, uh, well, look, I'm sure if that uh, carcass is, you know, on the side, you know, right on the uh, with the edge of the water. Then, yeah, you know, the, it's a scavenger. I know, will try. You know, it's a possibility for sure. But if they know that this crocodile is there, well, maybe it'll think twice about it. But. No, predator is a predator, a predator, a predator. Scavenger, well, if there's an opportunity, well, I'm going to take that opportunity. But they won't go and dive in the water there now, where the killer is, to try and retrieve it. But if they do that, you know, they're going to put themselves in a lot of danger. I mean, a crocodile will just take that hyena straight into the water and drown it. So I think for now, they will just... Uh, let the crocodile have that to himself or herself. I'm not too sure if it's a male or female. It's always difficult. There's no ways we'll be able to tell unless you catch the crocodile and flip it around and then you can check. But other than that, we won't do that. <laughs> There's no ways. <laughs> And now and again, if the crocodile wasn't when the cro crocodile wasn't feeding on this kill, um, like yesterday, you actually saw a little bit of the catfish, so the barbel, the terrapin. They would come there and they all start nibbling little pieces off of the kill. So you see a lot of uh, other predators that will be feeding on them, different ones. As you know, the, the terrapins are carnivorous, so they will feed little pieces of meat there. But for now, I think they're just uh, avoiding it. Mm. 
And that's the beauty of uh, wildlife. You have just, a, you just, you just never know what you're going to find around the next corner. It surprises you every single day. And this is nature at its be uh, at its beauty. It's I know sometimes it can be harsh, but it's just nature, you know, just in general. It's just nature. crocodile's head is almost as long as the water buck's neck. And this dam holds the water very well. So I wonder if this crocodile is not going to remain here for a few more weeks. It'll be very interesting to see. See this little pieces coming off. Liz, 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 yeah, no, it's so it's always, it's, my water is always amazing. It's, you can just sit here for hours and just watch this, all this little bit of action around you. Oh, nice getting in there now and always just see what comes down here what's in the water the sounds Just for a little bit of the light, because we're on a, on a bad, like the spot where we're sitting at now at the moment, we've got the sun that's behind, and it just, it's reflecting off the water quite, uh, quite a bit. And this is only the only spot that we can really sit at and uh, have a view of this crocodile. still sit here and uh, watch this uh, entertaining uh, croc. I think uh, let's go and watch uh, a beautiful clip all about water holes.
Waterholes are nature's gathering points for friend and foe. Families and friends converge and reunite. Others seek relief from the midday heat. Some must drink daily. Some get thirsty after a large meal. Murky water can be camouflaged. source of food. And sometimes safety. At the height of the dry season, water holes are a source of vital moisture and frequently Whatever the season, waterholes provide a sense of peace, wonder, and wilderness entertainment. Welcome back. If you're just joining us for the first time, we are sitting here in front of our meerkat colony. And we are waiting for them to poke their heads out to enjoy the lovely morning sun. Now, I thought I saw one poke its head out and then kind of disappeared pretty momentarily. But I think if we... Wait here patiently. Patiently, we should be able to be able to have them come out. Oh, they do get a little bit skittish around vehicles, and that's just because, just because they are small creatures, don't quite know exactly what our agenda is. And um, obviously, being small creatures, they are targets. They are prey items for a lot of other predators. So skittishness and wariness is something that they need to have in order to keep themselves safe. And I think... Uh, the higher the sun gets up, the more chance of us hopefully being able to see them. They've got to come out and do a little bit of feeding and foraging. And they won't venture too far away from their colonies or a colony where they can uh, disappear into. Like I said, they are a fairly smallish animal which means like i said they can be preyed on by all sorts so that means they've got to be pretty close to their their homes in order to evade predators be it a bird of prey a jackal a big cat um snakes especially for youngsters snakes can be problematic It's 
Sarah so Bunny indeed. Peekaboo, peekaboo. Oh, I got so excited. I saw I thought I saw one. But it was a bird. And it's just come out of one of those holes. It's possible that uh, that particular bird could be nesting in um in one of these burrows or in the roof in the roof of the burrow. Quite often that's what birds all do. Um They'll make their homes inside of somebody else's home because they know that if somebody else is living there, they'll be the ones to stop intruders from coming in and the bird doesn't have to do anything. But basically what happens is uh, there'll be a centaur and that'll be the meerkat that's in charge of making sure that there are no predators around, making sure that we're not doing anything we're not supposed to. And, uh, you know, basically the, he is the eyes and ears for the colony and the outside world. Now, the centaur meerkat is normally the meerkat that you see the last or you see first. And that is what I thought I saw earlier. Someone poking their head out. Have a look. Check the coast. See if it's safe. Oh, no. There's people approaching. Not safe. And disappeared back into the hole. Oh, I see something else, but I don't know if that's... Is that that bird? Where? In the middle there. Um, no, further to the left. Just below that termite mound. It does look like a meerkat. Looks like two of them, maybe. Yeah. I love meerkats. No, don't go away. Oh. It's starting. It's starting. I can see them slowly starting to pop their heads out now. Right, so we've just had two out now, and hopefully that will be enough to encourage. Is it still one? Oh, I was hoping it would have been two. Was that? I'm, I'm sure two is enough to encourage everybody to vacate the household. Oh. Hello, little meerkat. How are you doing this morning? I was just checking the surroundings. It's always important. And a uh, very big job for this specific meerkat because his eyes need to detect the predators. So if it's not safe, he can't allow the rest of the colony to come out. And they are youngsters, from what I've heard, uh, in, a, in this colony from other guides. So... We'll cross our fingers and our toes and hope that they all come out and bring the little youngsters out to show us. Oh, Queenie, indeed they are. They are undefeated and uh, <laughs> on a bit of a roll. Just watch this little meerkat slowly disappear. But yes, between meerkats and mongoose, um, the title lies, lies between them because goodness gracious, those creatures can hide. And then I think a close second would have to be a monkey. Vervid monkeys can hide very, very well. Anyway, we're going to sit here a little bit longer and see who comes out. In the meantime, we're going to send you up to Steve. Well, 
I love the game of hide and seek. <laughs> but we've we haven't been hiding, but we have definitely been seeking. And what have we seeked here this morning? I'm going to get down in the soil, and uh, you probably notice that there's a pile of something here. It might not look like a lot, um, but there's a there's a scratch there, and there's a scratch there. There's a scratch over here, and then another scratch. A couple of scratches, a couple of scratches. So something's buried something over here. You can't see it clearly, but right over here is a Steenbock track. Over there is a Steenbock track. But in my experience, a Steenbock, they, um, the male will do a V, and the female will do a, a, a square box. So this could very much likely be a Steenbock, that V there, or a square. But this one has done more here and more here, which makes me feel like it's possibly a cat. Hence why I've got my stick, because I've done this before. I've been so excited to show you Steenbock droppings where I stuck my hand in there and I came out with. So we're going to investigate what's inside the soil. Let's see. Who's buried what over here? There we go. That's it. Not a steenbok pellet, that's for sure. Okay. Okay, so look at that. That is definitely cat scat. Oof. <laughs> Thank you for burying it. And you can see the pinch on the end of this one here. So I'm going to assume that this was a wild cat that did this. Nasty buried, perfect. If you've ever had a cat in a litter box, you know how your cats will, will poo and then will turn and will scratch like that. So this characteristic feature of in and around is that of a wild cat. So we've scratched around this area here and we were looking for that animal that we kind of saw from a distance and my first thought was wildcat with the way it moved but just the way that it was standing it was quite far away I thought young hyena but we haven't seen um, exactly what it was so I'm thinking that it maybe is the same animal that has gone and pooed over here now he's buried it for a reason dinosaur can I tell the, oh there's more can I tell the age of a cat by its scat well you probably could by the size of it, you know, being a, a young leopard or an old leopard, a male or a female, just by the, the bulk. Um, but I wouldn't be able to tell you, looking at a, a wildcat scat, knowing if it's a, a youngster or an adult. But they buried it. Thank you very much for doing so, because it was rather, rather smelly. I think I just hit myself with the stick. Oh, well. La V. That's pretty cool. Now I've learnt in the past by my own mistakes, everybody, to use a stick because, well, getting back in the car now with a cat scat all over my fingers really is not a vibe. Okay, well, we're going to carry on in this direction. We're going to go see if we can find that baby giraffe. And while we do so, let's send you back over to Setters. Uh, Steve, 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 Steve. I'm hoping that uh, there was no poo on that poo stick. But yep, we are still here uh, with uh, the crocodile and its uh, kill. And we just repositioned now just to get us see if we can get a bit of a, a better angle with uh, light wise. Let's see, let's see if the light is a little bit better from the side here. And all of a sudden the crocodile has decided to go into almost sleep mode. Let's see. And he's just trying to build up the courage. Oh, there you go. There, mate. Oh, slowly approaching again. Come on, take a big bite. You can do it. You can do it. Oh, 
Actually, we're waiting here yeah, just to see if we can get that moment where all of a sudden it feels like it actually can devour the entire head at once. That would be nice, just to see that happening. So I think once it's finished off with all the meat around the neck area, you might just think, okay, well, now it's just the perfect size is to grab that head and uh, swallow it whole. It looks like it's just got some stage fright now. No, Chrissy, I think uh, <laughs> I think a crocodile's uh, stomach enzymes is so strong. I mean, they can they can they can devour um, sure, the bones and horns and hooves, everything. So, you know, I don't think uh, if that uh, I don't think the meat can ever be too rotten because I can imagine this must be so rank at the moment. <laughs> We actually saw it just now, like a nice shot just now, and I, I oh know it is. Uh, we can actually even smell it. We can even smell it. Oh, there we go. Uh, crocodile doesn't mind at all, even if it's a week old, it'll still eat it. Meat is meat. Really now it's just not too phased on eating. So we might just start moving slowly but surely start heading a little bit to the further eastern area of uh, Juma just to see if any of those, maybe those male line, lines did not come over again. I just want to double check on that as well as maybe see if we can pick up on some uh, leopard tracks or elephants. You never know. I think we just got here in a, at the right time this morning when the crocodile, crocodile felt a little bit peckish. We're talking about hyenas now, so it's right next to the edge here. So hyenas can get to that easy, but that crocodile will <laughs> that crocodile will go for the hyenas. If those hyenas come anywhere close to that kill. A croc won't be happy. It'll grab that killer and drag it further into the water again. All right. Well, we're going to uh, move away from this area. I think let's head over to Erika Z. Still has those beautiful meerkats down there in Amakala. We have had our meerkats, or our specific meerkat, in and out, in and out. Staring off towards the left, I'm not too sure if there was something that the meerkat saw down that side that uh, it didn't quite enjoy. And that was probably about two minutes ago, two, maybe three minutes ago, it popped its head back down. So I'm sure it's maybe just relaying everything it's seeing to everyone underground. Oh, here we go. Here we are. Uh -uh. Come back out there. Now, there's a clump of bushes behind that meerkat to the right. And we keep seeing them dip behind. So I'm wondering if there's maybe not another, you see, just like that. If there's not another burrow, that it keeps disappearing down into and keeps popping out in a different hole or if it's one big burrow and there's a bush in front of that 
because we see him popping up on the left and on the right hand side of that particular bush. Now he's on the right hand side. Started off on the left hand side, but we saw him also scurry across. Don't you think it's time that everybody comes out and starts to warm up? It's not, it must be cold in that borough, I can only imagine. But I suppose if there's a couple of them in there, their body heat put together should generally warm up the inside of it. And I think that's one of the benefits of living in numbers. Drew, uh, some snakes definitely, some I wouldn't say would be scared of a meerkat, but they should be. Um, yes, most snakes, most snakes will see meerkats and evade or move out the area immediately. And then you'll get some snakes that will actually stay. Most of the time the cobras will stay and then they'll hood themselves and they prevent themselves, well, present themselves as a, as, as a bit of a target indirectly and uh, meerkats don't take any nonsense especially when it comes to snakes <laughs> actually go and attack snakes and they'll mob them each one will take a, uh, uh, they, they time to bite the back of the tail of the snake or sometimes the back of the head if they can get there um, very very fast reflexes of course to add to the mix and they can make a, a snake's day quite bad and, um, you know, sometimes they also kill them and consume them. Meerkats are omnivores, meaning they eat meat and vegetable substances. I've never seen a meerkat occur at a snake before, but I've seen a couple of uh, uh, yellow-tailed mongoose have a go at some snakes, and wow, I felt sorry for those snakes. I think there was one in one encounter where there was a yellow mongoose and a Cape Cobra, uh, not too far from one of the lodges, and uh, one of the guests got it uh, on camera. A mongoose harassing the snake, and then eventually they all went in their separate directions. But uh, it doesn't always end like that. Sometimes it can end with a mongoose receiving a bite, and sometimes it can end with a snake receiving a bite. Hello, good morning, Mr. B. It's flying around my head here. Don't you have some flowers you can go and pollinate? I I'm not a flower. There's a little bird scurrying around at the back there with that mongoose. Not that mongoose, the meerkat. And I'm wondering if it's maybe a bird that hangs around these meerkats. Anyway, we'll wait and see. In the meantime, we're going to send you up to Steve to see what Steve's got. Well, welcome back everybody. We moved on from our scat and we found an impala that was in the open for a moment. He's rubbing his forehead against low hanging branches. And uh, everybody knows about the metatarsal glands on the back of the impala's feet, those black pom-pom like balls. But on the forehead of the man impala, there are cutaneous glands that they use for scent marking. Now the glands of the male on the forehead show marked seasonal changes in activity that are correlated with the reproductive cycle and obviously the rutting season that's on its way. The female has glands there as well, but there doesn't seem to be any change They'll use those glands for, for marking out their little zone. And when we start seeing a male like this in a zone, it's, he's declaring that this is an area that he wants to demarcate for the, in, the upcoming rut, which is very, very soon. 
We happen to be on an area called Impala Road. It's got nice access to the thickets and it's got nice open areas. So it's the perfect type of habitat. We find along this band, a number of males will be demarcating the prime real estate, which will obviously attract the females in. Riley, they do look so clean. They're constantly grooming themselves. They also assist with them. Um, with aloe grooming when they are in herds or when they are together. And these males that go off on their own start to get a little bit isolated. They don't want anyone really near them. They get a bit jumpy, they get a bit aggressive. And they basically just want to fight everybody or mate. Kind of get to that zone. <laughs> and the rat is imminent. I'm, I'm surprised we haven't heard any noises yet. We haven't heard any sounds of them pile yet. Have you, Gert? Mm -hmm. I don't hear a lot from my room when the fan is on in the evening. But um, right where we are, everybody, right where this impala is standing is where I had the female giraffe the other day. I was watching her closely and then just through these bushes I saw the movement and that was when we spotted the baby giraffe. So I was... I was hoping to uh, to maybe find her again, but it's possible she's moved off. I haven't seen her again since Monday. So in a study they did with regards to the forehead glands and the metatarsal glands, the study supports the hypothesis that uh, the forehead glands in males have a very important signaling role in the rutting season and the metatarsal glands which don't change they stay the same they don't change at all they have a much more general probably social role in maintaining and restoring contact between herd members the thought is when the impala runs and gets frightened those glands on the back legs give off a a hormone or a pheromone which enables the herd to find themselves once again But being in our social cue, animals want to find each other, there's safety in numbers. Whereas the development or increased activity on the forehead glands in the males is a very good indication that it is used for scent marking and not throughout the year. Luna, it is a really nice piece of research. Let me try and find the journal that I got it from again. It's important to it's important to reference where work is found. National Institute of Health. was uh, cutaneous glands of male and female in parlors, apicerus melampus, seasonal activity changes and secretory mechanisms. Welsh et al. 1998. We've had a little bit more luck here with our meerkats. We had a few more out and... Oh, look, these are the ones cuddling up to each other there in the sun. But now that the sun is starting to actually produce some heat. I think we'll find that they'll be more starting to appear. As this is the warmth, this is the the type of heat that they want to experience, you know. They want to warm their bodies up after a long night of trying to keep warm.
but it's pretty cool. We have, haven't had more than three out, or should I say more than four? Uh, about three of them out and about, and, and they all slowly disappeared again, and then one of them came out again. I think the fact that the birds are all kind of hopping around uh, does help a little bit, because obviously meerkats know that if there's trouble, there'll be no birds around on the floor. The birds would have all hid themselves or hid themselves in the bushes. Oh, come on, meerkats, come on out. He's a little youngster. You say you see a youngster. I thought I saw a little youngster there, sort of on the left-hand side next to that adult. And I don't see it anymore. cautious they are incredibly cautious but I think as soon as as soon as these two are comfortable and are happy we should start to see a lot more start to pop out I think this colony is probably about 19, 20, 22 strong. There's a couple. Definitely three out now. Three little mere cats sitting in the sun. Four! Oh, I shouldn't say that too loudly. Don't want to scare them away. Four little mere cats. Uh, Mina, I think if they are in their burrows, they'll definitely be able to hear hear us coming. And I think that may affect their uh, ability, or well, not their ability, or it may affect their, them wanting to come out. I don't think they'll come out more if they hear lots of action on top of the surface. But um, Oh, now that we've been sitting here, I mean, we've been sitting here for probably about 20, 25 minutes now. And uh, it's taken, it's taken this time to have this many cute little me again. And I've also got some water buck coming down the road. We are not on water buck road, unfortunately. This is hard to be as road. We did see some hard to be as earlier. They, well, as quickly as they appeared, they disappeared. Oh, this is really, really, really cool. I think it's now starting to get to that perfect, perfect ideal temperature. And uh, it's starting to get really, really warm. 
And now among our meerkats are appearing. Oh, have a look. Good morning, everybody. I think there's about four or five of them out and about now. But the one on the left being fairly smallish. And then the one second from the left. And then obviously a big adult in the middle, on, well, second from the right, and then on the right hand side as well. Definitely keeping an eye on us, but they are also looking around. This is very cool. We're going to send you up to Cedric to check in with him and his safari. Thank you, Eric. All right, so my update for now is that I have left uh, the crocodile as he munching on his uh, kill there at Bifflesuk Dam. And I came up here onto the eastern side now of uh, Juma. I've got uh, two male lion tracks coming directly north from where we left those Makhli Makhli yesterday, a little bit further south, coming up on the Chila Cut Line and it looks like coming into this area. So I am going to try and see if we can find these two male lines, but uh, yeah, let's see. Let's uh, cross fingers that uh, we can locate on them. It'll be brilliant if we can't, or if we can. I say they're not the most relaxed males when it comes to a person on foot. So, I'd rather just try and remain on the vehicle as much as I can, unless I need to do a little bit of footwork. We're coming to this area, it's not easy this block. And it's on top of all the vehicle tracks. Just hoping that they did not f move out from the area last night, maybe they've gone into Biffle's Hook, but we'll just double check on that. Well, you know, this is live interactive, so if you've got comments, questions that you want to send through to us this uh, morning, and if you are watching on the Wild Earth website, make sure that you do register so you can send those comments and questions through. You are right, Beaks? Beaks suffering a lot of hay, hay fever here this morning. You can imagine all the dry grass around, all the little seeds and a little bit of pollen and that floating around here. trying to see, I'm trying to figure out what's happening here. I'm hoping that did not, because it looks like they're on the, because they came back east. So they went into Torchwood last night and then it looks like they popped back east again onto the boundary, our eastern boundary road. Maybe you want to push in this side. I just want to see those two male lines again. Some very hard, hard sections here on the road. So if they do come in and they cross directly out into the other side, then sometimes you can just miss one track and they're gone and it's tickets. At least we got the, a general idea on their movement, on which way they want to move.
did I see one track? Yeah, no, I didn't. I thought I saw a track. No, let's go a little bit further up. It's in this side. Always trying to try and understand which direction and uh, just to see exactly where, why do they want to go in that area and where are they going to head to. We're still sitting here with our beautiful, beautiful meerkats. And uh, you know, they all over the place. Eh? They really are in and out, in and out. Some are up, standing, staring at us, looking around, disappearing. But this is definitely the start of their morning movements. Definitely. And uh, I think as the day progresses, I'll find that they may all come out. Probably not in the presence of us, but they may all come out and then they'll start feeding. Um, they'll probably head down towards the left-hand side. Because I know that there's another sort of like set of, or, or yeah, kind of collection of tunnels and burrows in amongst some of the Fainbos plants over there. So I've seen them there before. Um, so they may head off towards that side and further down into the valley for feeding. But obviously, like I said, not too far away. It's just in case there are predators, they need to be able to escape. And uh, meerkats are not slow creatures at all. They are fast, very, very fast. Now, the habitat for a meerkat is one of very many. You know, th this is this is a, a, a biome. You know, this grassland biome, this uh, coastal thicket, this uh, uh, semi savanna almost is perfect for them. They can they can survive here. Um, and this is really, really hard soil here. So, you know, when they dig, they, they're really going to have to use their claws. And they've got claws on the end of their paws. They're really going to have to use them to dig for, for bulbs and all sorts of burrowing spiders. But they're also used to living in the, in the desert with lots of sand. So meerkats farm throughout the Kalahari and most places leading up towards the Kalahari as well. The Karoo I think would be you know almost the best habitat for them. Plenty of beetles and uh, insects, locusts, grasshoppers uh, flying around there for them and uh, no, I think beetles and grasshoppers make up majority of their diet. But uh, yeah, you can find the uh, meerkats as far north as Angola from here, from South Africa. And uh, I think that's very impressive for this little, little creature. Wild at heart, it is good to be back. And I'm very glad that we were able to show you our beautiful, beautiful meerkats on our first live day back. What excitement, what an amazing, it's awesome, awesome, awesome. I mean, the last time that we were here, we weren't so lucky. We definitely weren't as lucky as we've been now. So, well, incredible.
little less movement now from the ones that are out they've sort of stayed there they haven't really moved there's been one or two that are investigating whether they want to be outside do they want to be back inside uh, haven't quite made up their minds yet Fleeting glimpse meerkats are very interesting to watch. And yes, they do. They do always look like they're busy. I can tell you that their necks, their neck muscles and their eye muscles are definitely busy because they are working over time. They are looking left to right, left to right, left to right, looking up and down. Their eyes are moving all over the place, zooming in, zooming out, focusing. So, Oh, they're very busy, but when they start their foraging, they become even more busy. I'm starting to see, I think, I think there's about five there now. And if I'm not mistaken, this is as close as they're going to allow us to get to them. Uh, Jerry, if the weather had possibly destroyed a den, uh, making it not impossible to live in, but uh, maybe uncomfortable, um, it's possible... Sure, we've got a lot of meerkats out now. Uh, it's possible uh, if they find that there's too many predators in the area, like too many birds of prey. That's also another reason to move um, burrows. Because if your burrow is like right next to the nest of like a jackal buzzard or a pale taunting goshawk or a, a common buzzard or even a secretary bird, it's probably not in the safest of places. Um, but uh, I, I believe this particular colony bounces in between three different burrows. Oh, birds, please don't scare my meerkats away. You guys can go and fight somewhere else. I've got orange-throated long claws, or cape, cape long claws, fighting with each other here. And I could see those meerkats were not too happy when they flew towards them. There's one creeping around, leopard crawling around there. Every now and then he stops to have a look at us to make sure that we haven't advanced. But yeah, so there's another burrow just to the left, or another set of burrows just to the left of this uh, colony's burrow. And then uh, very close to um, one of the lodges here, Shossi Lodge, there's another burrow um, or colony where they often can be found. And I think the last time we came up here, we had no luck with them, not even one. So it's possible that they may have been down at that colony. Oh, this is amazing. Caitlin, indeed, indeed, there's always one on the lookout. And uh, in this case, it's more than one. I think Morgan counted seven at one stage. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a big step up from our three that we've been watching the whole time. And our two, on our elusive two. Sure. Amazing. Oh, 
Right, I think what we're going to do is we may leave these meerkats to their devices so they can start feeding. In the meantime, what we will do is we're going to send you up to Steve. Have a check-in with him. Thanks, Eric. Well, I caught up with a very impressive male kudu who's moving very tentatively through this semi-woodland area. We had the Kambula male last night, not far from where we are. Pays to be vigilant. Pays to take your time and just put one foot in front of the other. He's going to go behind the bush. Of course he is. cousin of the Nyala. Olivia, they don't. They don't perform a dance at all. Males will fight very heavily with other males for dominance and then they hold on to their harem or their breeding group of females. Whereas Nyala are very seasonal. The Nyala will dominate each other. They'll dance and they'll exert dominance and then mate with the females that are estrus and then it's a very loose association they don't really then seemingly hold on to that breeding herd for years to come whereas a big male kudu will once he's claimed a group of females he will hold on to them until he dies not very easy to see now on the other side of that bush he's taking it very very slow Maybe there's something here we can't see. There's a squirrel shouting. We're just here on the Bufasuk boundary on the north towards the western side. squirrel but he's really not happy so we're going to go a bit closer see if we can investigate we send you over to the eastern side and catch up with mr cedric thank you steve uh, all right so i'll just be in uh off the vehicle for a little bit just to see exactly where those lion tracks have gotten into so they went into the in coming into this area and uh we are now and uh yeah i just want to see if we can pick up on anything else this side but it looks like general direction might be even heading towards uh, bifflesuk dam so where we had the the crocodile a little bit earlier it seems like the tracks are heading all the way all the way into that side so yeah let's just take a look just uh, scan this area as nicely as possible Unfortunately, that block is uh, the grass is so thick and uh, you know to be off the vehicle like exactly like yesterday when I saw those lions so it's Kruger lions mostly most of the time they're in the Kruger Park the monthly monthly males and um, you can clearly see they are not used to people on foot at all at all so uh, it's pointless me trying to walk in the into the thickets there and if it's them they're just gonna run they're just gonna run or well, sometimes you can even have uh, the opposite effect you know sometimes they you, know, you can even have a situation where they they'll come for you so i'm not too comfortable on foot with uh, lions that i'm not too familiar with
Michelle Stem, yeah, I said the uh, so, uh, that young Telemati male. Uh, what happened two days ago when the Kambulas came in, they chased the Nkurumas to the west, the Nkuruma Pride to the west. Uh, we had his tracks coming all the way along the northern boundary here on uh, Bilfuzuk Bounty. They found him inside Torchwood and uh, yeah, and then that was uh, yesterday morning. Yesterday morning, I found him inside Torchwood, and uh, yeah, that was the last I heard of him. So he went back, kind of going east again. I won't be surprised if he's realised all the pressure from all the males this side. He's not going to hang around. You've got the Kambula males. You've got now these other two males. You've got the Black Dam males. So yeah, no, not, it's not going to be a wise idea to hang back this side. So it looks like he's gone a little bit further east. As well as, so just a quick update as well. So when the Nkuruma Pride was chased by the Kambulas, uh, not last night, the night before, uh, the guy said they found the Nkuma Pride close to Safari Lodge area and uh, they only found five of them there. So it was just a, just a young male that was not there. So when we had it, and we had them the previous morning, we had Monday morning and Monday, actually Monday afternoon, we actually had the young male with Nkumas before they got chased. So I think at the end of the day, he might be also a little bit lost somewhere. I'm hoping that he regroups with the, the pride. I think it's good that Juma has had a lot of lion activity. Obviously being in the concession, not always able to have the lions on the property that they operate on. So I think that it's good that there's lots of activity here. We haven't had so much cat activity here. We haven't seen too much of them. Lots of jackal tracks all over the place. The jackals are definitely very, very active. But, uh, no, we are bumbling around this road named after a very old elephant, Norman, and uh, we're hoping to see all sorts. We left our meerkat to their devices, they looked very happy, and then when we started our engine, we may or may not have chased them back into their burrows, but they'll be out in no time to enjoy the heat, and then obviously start their feeding. For the time being, we'll just drive very slowly through these fields, scanning for all sorts. Maybe we can see something special. Oh, there's a secretary bird over there. It's quite a distance, but maybe we'll be able to see him. Oh, over there. A secretary patrols. Boss.
Hail to thee, blithe spirit. Bird, thou never wert. That from heaven or near it, pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Higher still and higher from the earth thou springest. Like a cloud of fire, the blue deep thou wingest. Well, welcome back live, everyone. Sorry about that. Sometimes broadcasting from these wild locations live comes with its challenges. Now, we figured out why that kudu was behaving like that. Um, it was walking right into the area where a lion pride killed a kudu just before I got here. I think the night before I got here. So it went and investigated, it was sniffing, and then moved off. So very interesting. I mean, it's something we're very familiar with, with elephants going and revisiting sort of sites where their, their um, beloveds or their family members have fallen. But that kudu definitely went to go and investigate. Um, I'm not sure, Ghat, if you know if it was a male or female kudu that was fed upon. Maybe it was a female and he was just going to go and see if his one of his ex-partners, Dolores, was, was still around or if, if maybe she'd left something for him. <laughs> Shame. Circle of life, everybody. Circle of life. Kim elephants family dynamics are very very special I do connect with them really really deeply I think most people can there's a sentientness to them they express joy and pleasure and they show fear and pain oh sorry and they grieve they most certainly grieve and they mourn and they come back and come back and come back to a site. It's been well documented that they will revisit the site. No other animal that I know of is known to do that. It's always nice to learn a little bit more about elephants and their social structure. Let's go have a little look. Elephants have fascinated us for so long because they display the same social complexities and full emotional range of our own human species. Mothers, sisters, cousins and aunts live in herds while the bulls wander the wilderness as bachelors. Cows live in the same herd from birth until the end of their life some 60 years later. The herd is led by the oldest and wisest female, the matriarch. She's not only responsible for leading the herd, but also dishing our discipline to the often unruly teenagers. With their flappy ears, floppy trunks and folded skin, baby elephants have the cuteness edge over their human counterparts. Like toddlers, they are playful, curious and love rolling about in the dirt.
Human voices and vehicles provide endless entertainment for bored little elephants, and they, in turn, are always a source of amusement for us. Exploring is the main source of calf entertainment, but it's a scary and sometimes prickly world out there. And mum is thankfully never far off. Bulls become boisterous when they hit puberty, and this irritates the matriarch. Once she's had enough, she will boo them out of the herd to find their own way in the world. Like playground bullies, the young males fight for dominance, sometimes with extreme violence. The older bulls live alone but mentor these young bucks. It is these fellows that are the ultimate gentlemen of the wilderness. I will agree with that one. Baby elephants are the most entertainment one could have. They run around like headless chickens. They swing their trunks around like they whips. They <laughs> they're very inquisitive, you know. And then they get that, that, that bit of grumpiness, you know. When a baby elephant is grumpy, they stick their, their, ear, their ears out and they puff their trunk up and they, they, they pick their feet up when they walk. Amazing, I love it. And um, sometimes you can get yourselves into trouble with little elephants, uh, with mom. Because sometimes a little elephant will become quite curious about the vehicle and very inquisitive, and they'll come and investigate. And you know, maybe there'll be a, a slight noise in the vehicle or something uh, set settling or, or or shifting, and that will scare the baby elephant away, which will then turn around and run with his tail in the air, you know, back to mom. Mom turns around, seeing that her baby is now upset. She'll try and figure out, oh, we've got some, uh, there seems to be some visitors here in this pond. We've got some marsh terrapins. Well, not really a pond. This is a very, very big uh, puddle. Very deep puddle too. Um, but I uh, see there's two terrapins. And one is swimming along the side there. Now, if you were walking past this, you might not be able to see them. They obviously heard the vibrations of the car. And uh, there's a thin, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not what it is, but it, it looks like a thin layer of cappuccino foam on top of this puddle. It's definitely not a thin layer of cappuccino foam. Um, <laughs> anyway, the, there's one very big one. I can see his head is much bigger compared to the one on the far side of the pond who has now disappeared but this is one way to tell you can normally see that it's a terrapin the little lip they kind of their nostrils really um and a bit of their mouths their eyes still sort of under the surface and um are these these guys will feed on all sorts of things. They'll feed on plant matter, they'll feed on tadpoles. I mean, if they can get a hold of a frog, they'll feed on a frog. Um, they're also known to, yeah, like I said, they, they're known to become quite uh, uh, carnival-like. Yeah, they do eat a lot of meat of other animals, of carcasses. If there was a dead animal, in the water, they'll feed off the dead animal, no problem. You know, it's 
extra uh, protein source. It's pretty cool. But um, no, this, these are the kind of things you, you really do need to worry about when approaching uh, sort of big potholes um, and big areas where the water is deep and you've got to drive through it. You just approach the edge and by approaching the edge, you'll generally be able to see some form of movement. If you don't see any movement, um, wait a few seconds and if you still don't see any movement, then the chances that the, there's somebody living inside the, well, little puddle are very slim. But I don't think we're going, oh, it depends. This might be a undrivable puddle. Now, here at Wild Earth, from Wednesdays to Fridays every week, we will be hosting a school drive where we have kids from all over asking us all sorts of questions in their classes at school. And uh, the teachers register on wildearth.tv forward slash kids in order for these kids to be able to ask questions, to engage with us, to widen their knowledge. Now, this will be from 3.30 until 4.30. So an hour every afternoon, every, well, not every weekday, from Wednesday to Friday. Those are the times that school drive will take place. The second one has appeared, but it's not... I can see it, but I can't really see it very, very well. I think it's it. Say again. Where? It's on the left-hand side of the middle maniki. On the very far side of the pond. Close to the road. Yes. Now, this puddle has obviously been here for uh, a few days already. Um, and these guys have obviously made themselves at home here. I think they're pretty happy here. Obviously, vehicles will come past and the odd person that doesn't see them may drive through the, the waterhole. I do hope that people are watching when they're driving into these water holes here because it's very easy for them not to move out the way and to get driven over and that's obviously not what we want a very interesting they won't crawl around well some of them may crawl around to get to other holes Monty, the difference between a terrapin and a turtle is um, the, the limb structure. So turtles have more flippers than legs. Terrapins have more legs than flippers. You know, they more closer to the legs of a tortoise. Um, a terrapin can... It can't retract its head into the shell, but it can push its head to the side uh, where it can be covered by the shell. Not quite the same way that a tortoise would be covered. Uh, turtles cannot hide their necks or heads in any way. Um, and then, of course, you know, the main difference is one is a saltwater animal and one is a freshwater animal. Terrapins are freshwater, turtles are saltwater, and uh, generally turtles are big. You can get really, really big turtles, but then you can also get really, really small, cute little things. Terrapins don't really get very, very big terrapins. Um, 
So I know in America you can get those big snapping, snapping terrapins, and you those. Oh, you don't want to get your finger stuck in that. I'm assuming all of this foam has come from the fact that this has been a very, very busy part of the road. I can only imagine. Because I'm looking at another kind of bit of puddle or another puddle next to us and it's just covered in brown water. This one has got the cappuccino foam. Hmm. Probably definitely, definitely worth researching what creates this white foam. But if anybody does know, uh, information would be ideal. It would be most appreciated. Sort of lost. I've lost one of the terrapins now. He's disappeared. And uh, semi-aquatic animals, obviously, uh, still needing to breathe oxygen in order to survive. So they do need to come up to the surface. But you'll find if this, when this puddle starts to dry out, they'll actually burrow themselves into the mud. And that's where they'll stay dormant until the next rains. All right, you've got a beautiful yellow build stalk here at Gauri Dam. This is fantastic. This is amazing. I still always have these stalks around here. One of the wading birds. You can see it's just going through, opening its beak, putting its beak in the water, opening it up. And as soon as it pretty much feels any movement coming through there, it'll snatch that fish or the frog up. I do apologize here. I think there might be some noise in the background. Um, I think they got, oh, maybe this ate something. This is some, someone with a chainsaw close to the camp area. Let's see if we can get a lucky, another one. What is it it's catching there? Do you, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can look a little bit closer. I don't know what it's actually eating. Oh, bless you. Beaks. There you go. Oh, a little fish. It's like a little something silver. Did you see that again? They're like little tilapias. But the small ones. Now you see how it uses its feet to try and disturb the sediment on the bottom and to chase whatever is hiding in that mud. And as soon as it comes out, it, it might swim towards its beak area. And you can see it's felt something there. You can see now it's working that area. Watch. Oh, 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 he lost out on that one. That is amazing. I love that little shuffle. Oh, I'm a cop shuffles going there. <laughs> yeah, Calvin is it. Even though you use the wings sometimes, so it'll lure it. Use the wings, like, you know, when you kind of uh, lure something into a little spot, and that's exactly what it's doing. It's almost kind of pushing whatever's swimming away. And it's like, hey, come back here, come back here. And towards its uh, beak. Watch, 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 watch. No, this is something that almost looks like my dance moves on a good old Saturday evening. <laughs> hey, Beeks? Yeah. Oh, there. Oh, there. Oh, guys like, yeah, no, look, I don't think uh, he'll be dancing that way. Three banded plover running at the back end. Yeah, 
got something again there. No idea, but it's got maybe those little fish. Might be even frogs. Sometimes you get them in huge flocks. Mm -hmm. Alarm calling, yeah. I hear the, hear the squirrel alarm calling, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look there just now. Oh, there you go, another one. Oh, it's, been, it's quite successful. I think it was last year or the year before, there was one stage there at uh, Biffleswick Dam, that dam where we had the crocodile. And we had like 15 yellow-billed storks there. 15. And are there guys fish here? Yeah, look, it's got... Boop. Ah, yeah, there's fish. Very small ones. Apparently they said there was a, <coughs> quite a scuffle here last night or this morning with uh, two hippos. Uh, another one hippo is uh, there at Treehouse Dam. And um, I'm not too sure where the other one went. So uh, I said that some, there was a scuffle behind the dam wall. I might end up just going down Twin Dams Road just to go and look towards Chilipan area. At least we've got a little bit of time left to do that. If I'm not mistaken, those are the, ye the yellow bull stork. They do not make any noises. They don't call or anything. I just want to double check if it is them. All right, well, I'm just going to investigate on why the squirrel's alarm calling a little bit further down behind the damn wall. Then let's head over to Steve as he's doing some birding. Thanks, Setters. Well, we've got a brain slung arend, also known as the brown snake eagle. Now you might ask me, how do I know that it is a brown snake eagle? It is difficult in the light to see the color and to see all of the sort of characteristic features of it, but the way that this bird stands on the branch which is very characteristic. It's quite a quite a bulbous head, like a light bulby sort of head. It stands with a very upright sort of back posture. And uh, we refer to that as the, the jizz, the general impression, shape and size. And the general shape of the bird perched up on the top of a tree, typical of a bird of prey. The size of it, most certainly bird of prey. And just the way that it stands with that very erect back posture makes it very easy to identify it as the brown snake eagle. And the name doesn't mean that they only eat brown snakes, everybody. They are a brown snake eagle. We also get the black-chested snake eagle. And then the Batalua eagle would also very much fall under the same grouping. They are very much a snake eagle as well. Both, or all three, having no feathers on the legs down to the feet, which is a characteristic feature of a true eagle. Beautiful silhouette, Caddy, indeed. Lovely dead tree. Providing the perfect perch. 
as he surveys the area for any movement. It's starting to warm up quite nicely now. So that's the way the cookie crumbles everybody. We've had lots of lion activity on Druma the last couple of days and now suddenly we find ourselves on Wednesday. Uh, some tracks still, but all the lions have gone west or east or south. There's the way things go. There's no guarantee what one will see on safari. We've had some nice general game activity this morning. I'm going to make a turn at Gowry Dam, see if anything's happening there. Gert says he hasn't seen elephants in days. It would be nice to see some elephants. I had a really wonderful sighting with some yesterday morning. I actually posted a reel about that. Just a nice little close encounter with a small breeding group just around the corner, actually. And very special to spend time with the elephant energy. There's a jackal on the road and he looks like he's contemplating life, doesn't quite know what to do. I hope I haven't insulted you now. He's, oh, there's a nice little smell going past that bush. Oh, definitely on a foraging mission. Where are you off to? Little guy, you're gonna pop out on the other side. Quite often, you'll find that these these guys hunting mice in and around clumps of uh, bushes like this. You know, they'll walk past and they'll hear, obviously, a mice busy, or a mouse. Sorry, not a mice. A mouse busy inside, and uh, the mouse is obviously gonna come out at some stage. And the jackal will either engage the mouse in the bush or wait for it on the outside. Most of the time they'll pounce in. But uh, and it was pretty cool. Uh, haven't seen very many jackals today. Seen lots of their footprints, but haven't seen very many of them. I wonder if we can actually follow him and see if he's still there. Mr. Jackal, where have, oh, he hasn't gone far. Oh, no, don't be like that. Sean, I must say, Jackals have interested me in the last yeah, so I've seen jackals doing some some very, very strange things. And I think one of them that stands out the most was a jackal eating um, off of a, uh, what was it, a hairy star apple. Jackal eating its fruit. Very interesting. Uh, this jackal's definitely busy. All sorts of nice smells. Stopping him from continuing along this road. 
It does look sort of semi-lost. Uh, doesn't quite know what it wants to be doing, but I'm sure something will come up. And quite often, not always, but quite often when you see one jackal, you'll generally see a pair. And I know that there have been some little youngsters here, so I'm not too sure. I'm wondering if this was maybe the, one of the adults. Because the jackals that I've seen in this area are definitely smaller than that one. Fran, it's great to be back. It's, uh, yeah, lovely, lovely to be back out in the bush again with the wild, wild animals, listening to all its, its noises. Mm. Doesn't look like it has much on its agenda. Other than bothering animals today. It was looking up in the tree now. Or maybe just lifting the nose. Caught a waft of a smell. It wants to investigate. Rather interesting. Well, it's nice of you to have stuck around for us, Mr. Jackal. You can continue with the rest of your day. However, I would love to see you pounce on something. That would be quite nice. But I think what we will do is we'll continue going on. I'll just reverse here quickly. to be us that normally we see in this area have still not come back. Moses, um, you'll find when a female jackal does give birth, she'll give birth to the jackals and they will live in a little burrow underneath. You'll normally find mom or dad around the outskirts of the burrow. Um, but for the most part, they'll generally just find a bush to go and hide underneath, um, a tree to sit underneath, basically. Adults don't really, don't really go down into burrows. Definitely a lot greener than what it is, and that's amazing. It's really nice. It's lovely to see the reserve looking like this again. I know towards the end of our last shift, it was becoming very, very brown. And it didn't really look like there was much grass to be eaten. Even though there was a fair amount of it still, but now most of it's nice and green. Hmm. All sorts of smells in the air. Smell something now that smelled like an elephant. I haven't seen any tracks coming into this area. So it could well have been some droppings that was maybe left behind from a couple of days ago, or there could be a bull in this area. There usually is one elephant bull in the dune forest area. They're not always the easiest to find. Obviously, because it's so so dense here, you know, even the, the, biggest, the biggest of animals can hide with ease. There's definitely 
currently damage in the area like the elephants were here. I know that they're not here, but there's definitely like a couple of green branches that are still broken. Branches that they may start, they may be starting to die already, which would suggest that they have been broken for about a week already. But um, smells don't lie. Interesting. So we're going to continue looking for a possible rogue bull. In the meantime, we're going to send you back up to Steve. Thanks, Eric. Something last minute would be would be wonderful. Even the hippo in. Gary Dam is not there. Interesting. Interesting. It's gone away for a midweek Friday. Wednesday today, midweek Friday. Or Little Friday, what do they call it? Nice, slow, relaxed drive this morning. We've thoroughly scoured the west, the south, southwest, and the north. Elizabeth, I'm glad you found a relaxed morning out of this. It's been quite relaxed. We had a few moments where we thought it was the perfect weather for some wild dogs to show themselves. Well, it's not over yet. We might find some yet, but um, tracks of a female leopard going off, tracks of a male lion going off, tracks of the Kambula male going off. We found where they met up on the Triple M boundary and then they went into Simbambili where they assisted or were assisted by the Umkuhuma pride to kill a buffalo. Such interesting dynamics that. And then Shadulu was found with Nene somewhere on Arethusa. Sounds like the track Cedric was following up on of male lions on the Cheetah Katla boundary where went into Bovelsuk and we had tracks of Tlalamba here this morning, not just this morning, yesterday morning, and they went north as well into Bovelsuk. So she probably was like, hang on, there's just way too many lions around Juma right now. I'm out of here. Which makes sense. In the past we've had that. We have a, a week or so of really intense lion activity. We don't find any leopards. Not that they aren't around, they're just keeping a very low profile. Just the other day we saw Tortoise Pan navigate around the four, the, the four small contingent of the Umkuhumas. Nice to be back today, Jillian. Nice to be back on your screens. I did, 
did receive a lot of messages from a lot of people. Okay, well, we'll just check one more time. We didn't check this western side of the open area close to our camp, past the bush bry site. Last few days we've had lion prides moving straight through this area. General game numbers have been pretty quiet here as well. Elizabeth, we're hopefully we can capture some of it. Uh, we've been missing a lot of it. We've been seeing some stuff. But a lot of what's been going on, I reckon, has been happening under the cover of darkness. And as soon as the lights switch off, the lions really come to light. Or to life, should I say. But it is an interesting dynamic, and we don't know who's going to win, who's going to dominate. The Kambulas definitely seem to try and seem to be trying to entrench themselves with the Unkuhuma pride. It will definitely not sit well with the black dam males. And these two other males that came in yesterday, where did they even come from? I don't know, but we had lion tracks, male lion tracks all over this property yesterday morning. Cedric saw two and I saw one. Just link around. We did scratch around this area here for that potential. If you missed us earlier, getting in the show, we found a little animal that could have been a baby hyena, could have been a wild cat. Neither Gerto or I are too certain. We were scratching around the area it ran towards for, if it was a baby hyena, then it definitely would be not venturing too far from some form of burrow. We didn't find anything. What we did find though was a, a covering up of some wildcat scat. Kind of leads me to believe that that's probably the, the results of the animal that we saw. But sometimes the wilderness is quite secretive and mysterious. And you don't always have to know what it is you saw. Sometimes the mystery is exactly what it's all about. Hello little steambok. We finally got your steambok this morning after staring off at a male that we never saw. All right, so coming to the end uh, of uh, of Sun Arises Safari this morning, and uh, it's been quite nice, nice and 
entertaining, some nice uh, stuff as well this morning. Plus, we just found fresh, fresh, fresh female leopard tracks coming up towards this open clearing from a, a road called Philemon's Cut Line. And there's only one female that would usually kind of cross there, cut across this drainage line and head straight here towards uh, this open clearing. And uh, I'm sure that must be old Tlalamba, the Queen of Juma. So maybe we get our last minute uh, leopard here, you never know. So I'm just keeping an uh, eye peeled here. But if not now, if not now, then this afternoon. Then this afternoon I'm going to work this area. Hmm? Oh, there's a ground hornbill, nice. Oh, it's a little ground hornbill that side. Caitlin, it's fantastic being back out again. And nice to see a ground hornbill, just one southern ground hornbill. It's just gone behind, don't go behind that tree now. There we go. Just roaming around here on the ground looking for any any potential prey and quite a variety of uh, things that they do eat snakes and snails, tortoise, lizards, skinks, chameleons, such a huge variety. But yeah, thank you so much for all the comments and questions this morning from everybody. We do appreciate it. And uh, it's good just to be out on again the world's largest safari vehicle. And all live and interactive. As the southern ground hornbill starts disappearing in the back end. But yes, this afternoon, make sure that you join us once again at uh, well, 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock will be uh, on Safari, the highlight show, and then out on our sunset safari at 3.30 on the kids drive between 3.30 and 4.30. But yes, from this beautiful southern ground hornbill, from BK, from the Wild Earth Crew, and from myself, have a wonderful morning further. We'll see you this afternoon. Goodbye.